Go ahead and get started. Okay. <laughs> um, hello, and welcome to today's community conversation, reflecting on five years of open access book publishing, successes, lessons, and next steps for Tome, co-sponsored by the Association of Research Libraries, the Association of American Universities, and the Association of University Presses. From 2017 to 2022, these associations ran a pilot in which participating institutions agreed to give three of their faculty members $15,000 subventions or grants to publish their work open access through a participating university press publisher that had already accepted the work for publication. Today's session is governed by the ARL Code of Conduct, which um, my colleagues will put in the chat. And um, as you've heard, uh, we are recording this session and we'll make it available on the Tome website at openmonographs.org. So my name is Judy Rutenberg. I serve as ARL's Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy, and I'll be your host for today's program. Um, first, my great appreciation um, for my colleagues in the Tome Partner Associations, Peter Berkery and Brenna McLaughlin from AU Presses, Toby Smith and Meredith Asbury at AAU, along with all of the members of the Tome Advisory Board, some of whom I see are with us today. Um, Nancy Marin, who authored the report, will be discussing today. And thanks to all of you um, in the community who responded to Nancy's survey and contributed data um, to this important report. We have a fabulous panel today. Um, Lisa Macklin from Emory, Peter Potter, formerly a visiting program officer at ARL, leading the Tome Initiative for several years, now at Dragoiter, and Charles Watkinson of Michigan Publishing. All of our pa panelists have been deeply involved in um, key aspects of Tome's development, some since the very beginning. Um, and I'm really grateful for their time and participation today. And we also look forward to a really lively engagement from the audience through the Q&A. So just like a quick note about what this conversation will really cover in depth, which is a detailed look at the cost of publishing tome monographs, specifically whether that $15,000 per book pilot designated subvention was the right amount. This was really deftly handled by Nancy Marin and Kim Schmelzinger in a report available on Humanities Commons, the cost to publish tome monographs. So I recommend it, and I thank AU Presses for commissioning that report in 2022. Instead, we're really here to dig into Tome's uh, stakeholder value assessment um, report. And the report references, and this audience is no doubt aware, of the recent growth of OA monograph programs globally. The, but today, we're really going to dig into Tome's unique features and des design features as a pilot, and in response to data um, about key stakeholder perspectives, so authors, publishers, and the institutions that intervened with this new funding model. And that unique design, those design elements included, one, academic leadership explicitly financially supporting the publishing mission of universities and the importance of humanities and social sciences scholarship. Two, that Tome drew institutional funding outside the library acquisitions budgets. And three, that funding went through authors to a network of university presses. And this network required a new role, institutional contacts that liaised with authors and presses. That role primarily resided in the library. Tome then created a community across this network, uh, meeting annually during the pilot. And Tome was a successful pilot. Here are some key indicators of that success over the five-year program um, with number of titles published, more than 170 authors, 30 presses published tome books, and an impressive sales average uh, print copy sold and download rate for the first 25 tome books that were really tracked carefully. And um, these numbers are slightly updated from the report that you have. Thank you to Peter Potter. <laughs> so while it was provosts that helped design and launch tome in 2017, as members of the, the original group, campus champions of Tome outside the library and press included deans and department chairs. Among the benefits of the Tome to institutions that we heard was this, promoting a focused conversation about the future of the humanities monograph 
among administrative units that might not otherwise think about this. In other words, it started conversations. And in fact, the sources of funds used for TOME grants subventions were distributed with more than half coming from outside, half those funds coming from outside the library. TOME authors surveyed overwhelmingly believed their books had more impact than they would have if they hadn't been OA. Now this is probably not a unique feature of TOME. It's more a ringing endorsement of open access book publishing and I'm pleased it was a finding of this report. But why TOME or what did they particularly value about this pilot? Um, 77 out of the 150 plus authors we surveyed responded and what they appreciated in order of importance, number one, making my scholarly work available to a wide readership, followed by for free, more affordable, and then some interest in the pilot itself and bringing attention to the, um, to the institution's research um, lower down. While presses were not specifically surveyed in this report, Nancy was able to draw from her prior interviews on the cost study to derive these po positive assessments of Tome by publishers, that editorial investments and processes for Tome were similar to other books, that the subvention offset financial risk of releasing a simultaneously OA version, and then flowing from that, it enabled some editorial risk-taking as presses um, moved into new subjects. As one press director said, the Tome grant offered support that allowed us to publish this, in this case, unusual book and make it available to a wider scope of readers while also expanding our list and pushing our boundaries into new areas of experimentation. What institutions appreciated about Tome. So by institutions, these are the people who served as liaisons between authors and presses, often handling matters like agreements and funding. This is based on a survey that went out to the 20 funding institutional contacts. We received 12 complete responses followed by 10 in-depth interviews. And the number one answer is shared with authors, making schol scholarly content widely available. But for institutions, the second most important reason or answer thing that they valued was about introducing this new model. So um, we do know from the participating institutions that there is some likelihood um, that these institutions will continue um, to support TOME or a TOME-like program. And if not TOME, in particular, there's a greater like a great likelihood of ongoing support for OA monograph publishing in general, which is great and also a success of the program, in my opinion. So this was a pilot of three membership associations, none of which specifically represented authors. Although societies, scholarly societies certainly helped shape home at the beginning, participated in various key meetings. I think everybody believes that there's a role for scholarly societies going forward in the governance of this kind of an arrangement, including um, these are, this is what follows now are the, um, recommendations for different stakeholders drawn from the report. Um, so including for societies, raising awareness among authors of open monograph publication support broadly, including Tome, but also other programs. Report recommendation for presses, led, which um, could be led by the university presses that um, participated. What might be needed to make this process easier? For example, greater alignment between open access publishing workflows and a general good digital design and accessibility kind of workflows. Is there greater alignment to be had there? And recommendations for institutions to convene. Um, and as we you know, see in the report, um, a wide range of stakeholders within the institution from which funding and other kinds of support might be drawn, but to convene them to figure out the demand what kind of funding might be available and to discuss criteria for what they might want to fund in a tome-like or to ongoing tome instance. So we've been asked, um, we the associations have been asked by institutions continuing to fund tome in this post-pilot phase, whether the brand will continue when sort of what becomes of tome. 
And at this point, um, what I can say is that ARL will maintain the openmonographs.org website, that we will continue to work with AU Presses to make sure that it has up-to-date information on participating presses and participating institutions, and any updated documents that come from the community. We will also work together to host some kind of online community space for the institutional administrators of TOME funding um, so that they can stay in touch with each other. So it's really time to hear from our panel. Um, what we're going to do this afternoon is I'm going to get an opening response from each of them, and then um, we'll have a discussion that includes any questions you put in the chat. So I'm going to open up the screen here a little, and um, we're going to start off with you, Charles. Um, can you uh, just kind of start your remarks by letting the audience know how and for how long you've been involved in TOME? So I'm a, I'm a true old timer. I was there right at the start when the hills were mountains. And uh, I mean, it really was the case that, uh, you know, if we think back to uh, the start of Tome, open access monographs is still a very new conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, it, a, a lot has changed in the landscape since then. And let me go ahead and just make a, a couple of remarks. I mean, these are, uh, I mean, the first the first thing that I wanted to say right up front is I think it's a huge testament to the um, staying power of uh, Judy, uh, Peter Berkeley, and Peter Potter that we're here at all. I mean, it was a uh, it was a lot of work that these three individuals have put into making this happen, and I think we should all be very grateful to them. Um, at the start of the program something that's very important to remember and that Judy emphasized in her remarks is this was always a pilot. It was a pilot, not a program. And I remember, I remember, I, I remember Paul Courant, uh, then uh, the provost at Michigan, um, being very excited by Tome because as a behavioral economist, he was asking the question, what happens if we drop some money in at the top of the system? What's going to come out at the bottom of the system? And when measured against that goal, this has been an absolutely fabulously successful pilot. Um, it was always envisaged as, a, as a, an opportunity to see what an institutionally funded model of open monograph support would look like, given that US higher education institutions have such different cultures and very different ways of doing things. And so I wanted to say that because the critiques like, why are practices so inconsistent between institutions? Or why don't publishers have a single way of dealing with the money that we give them? It completely misses the point. It fails to grasp that Tome was never envisaged as a coherent program. It was a pilot that was aiming to raise awareness, encourage discussion, and it crucially ensure that open access was not just a journals thing. Um, and pilots don't have to turn into programs to succeed. So measured against its original goals, this was a huge success. The second thing I wanted to point out is that um, something we learned from Tome is that authors don't want the cheapest options for monographs, even if funders may. So we're not digging into the $15,000 or whatever, but it was very striking in the report that a major reason that participating authors love Tome, and here's a quote, was because they felt supported by their press with the same care they have come to expect from traditional monograph publishing. So Tomes received a lot of criticism for using the $15,000 number, but the financial analysis of participating university press costs has shown that high-touch publishing, the sort of publishing that university presses do in the US, is, is what was wanted, um, is what authors liked. And there are absolutely choices that would reduce the cost of publishing. Um, so we could not exhibit at disciplinary conferences. We could de-professionalize -pro acquisitions editors, move towards a scholar-led mode. But what was clear is that that is not what authors want. That was clear from Tome that that is not what authors want. So that's really important. And the third comment I'll just make briefly is that funding for open access monographs, we now know, will be hybrid. It will come from multiple different sources. Um, and parent institution support for its faculty who wish to publish open access monographs, it can't be the only model for open access monographs, but it is a model. And 
the concern that really bedeviled Tome is a concern about inequity for non-affiliated scholars. But that was never Tome's responsibility to solve that problem. And that is where uh, you know, raising the issue was great, solving it, no, because there are other options now, like subscribe to open models from MIT, from Michigan, um, for the path to open model from JSTOR. Um, there are the uh, institutional consortium models like Lever Press or Punctum Books. They've been developed to deal with that issue. So I just wanted to put it in context. Great. Um, thanks, everybody, for for joining us today, and and I can attest to the fact that Charles had a lot more hair when this um, session when we started this. <laughs> um, not to mention, I did as well. But um, let me just offer a few thoughts um, that building upon what Charles said. So, um, so that. It's Charles's point about authors don't want the cheapest options. Um, that what really struck me in the in the findings is that that our authors actually really like OA, um, especially when it fits into a publishing process that they're comfortable with, that they that they understand. Um, over time, we may find that authors are more open to um, changing that process, becoming, as Charles said, you know, um, having different cost-cutting um, approaches built into the process. But at the moment, um, this was a way that uh, ensured that authors could be more comfortable, get involved in the system. And, and as we saw over time, at least I saw, because I was also a, the person at, at Virginia Tech that was um, recruiting authors, I found that author support grew substantially over the course of the pilot, and I think um, others would would agree with that. Um, another point I would make is again following up on the point about equitable, about whether tome the tome model is an equitable. I would just add that um, it as a pilot the. The question of equitability, we didn't, you know, we weren't taking that question on, as Charles said, but in the future, the tome model itself could be adapted to be however we could scale it in any way that we wanted to, to incorporate authors at other institutions that perhaps aren't as well funded. It's up to the community to decide how they want to fund um, tome so that the model um, it isn't that the model um, isn't equitable it's how we want to grow that model and I think there's still um, a reason why we should look at that model and continue to adapt it. Um, the other thing I would say about um, an, another key finding uh, for me anyway is that um, that any future models, if we're going to talk about this to be models, and I, I don't think there's going to be a single model. Um, I think there will be multiple models. And for those models to work and to be realistically sustainable, we need to be more dynamic and, and more sophisticated, I think, in how we um, particularly handle the, the generation of funding, but there will be a lot more experimentation to come. And what we need to do, I think, in the future is to build upon what we've learned from Tome and from um, the other initiatives out there. Um, and um, as Robert, as Charles said, it's we have to move beyond funding just um, from the libraries. We must incorporate multiple revenue streams. Um, we have to understand that sales will continue to be a part of the any successful OA system. Um, I, we have to have administrators beyond, beyond the libraries. Administrators need to have skin in the game. Um, it's not just R1 schools, but any universities and colleges that benefit from having their faculty get published and cited they need to be participating in the funding of this. And I think we have to find creative ways to generate funding uh, from other players in the system. Um, 
aggregators, for instance, um, who are figuring out how to make OA content more discoverable within their particular platform systems and environments, they're benefiting from this. They should have skin in the game as well. Data analytics companies, I think there are ways for the corporate entities that, that are benefiting from the publication of academic research for them to be contributing to this. There are ways to do that, and that's a, another conversation. Um, just what, a few last quick takeaways. Um, I would say Tome um, is really different from the other kind of models out there in that it really was complementary to not um, competing with other initiatives. So, for instance, many Tome books were also Luminos books. They were Schump books, they were fund to mission books, they were direct to open books. We had Tome books on the Manifold platform. So I see Tome as having been really an attempt to, to generate um, community participation and work with other initiatives out there to, to push, push us forward in our understanding of how to, how to make access uh, scholarship more accessible. Um, the, Another thing that was perhaps surprising from when we initially started the um, the pilot, the idea that we ended up with 67 participating publishers, 20 funding institutions. We thought at the beginning perhaps that the there would be more. We the, the hard thing would be to get the presses to come on board. There would be more funding institutions. It ended up, ended up being the the reverse of that. That's a whole subject for discussion, but that that's an interesting finding. Um, another thing that as of yet, we have no, um, no real indication that um, the OA edition has any uh, negative impact on sales. So that's still an open question. Um, I know we're not dealing with the $15,000 subvention here specifically, but I think we did learn a lot about what it costs to publish a monograph. Um, and that it varies a lot among publishers. We still, the, the open question is that question of the, the sales revenue, what is the impact on sales? So that's still something we're, we're dealing with. And one last um, point I would make is that big picture, a uh, big piece of the picture that's still unclear is that of usage data. We need, um, we really need to have a centralized way of collecting that um, data. And we're, there are efforts underway to make that happen, but that's a, that to me for this, for OA monograph publishing to get embedded into the kind of the scholarly information system, we need better um, collection of, of the usage data. So those are my um, key takeaways. Great, lots to dig into there, um, but I'd like to hear from Lisa. Thanks, Judy, and thanks, Peter and Charles. Um, so a little bit of a touch of history about Emory because I think it's informative for the discussion. At Emory, we actually um, were fortunate enough to have a Mellon planning grant that predated the Tome initiative. So we were having conversations on our campus and I was fortunate to be in a committee um, that uh, Michael Elliott, who at that time was Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, pulled together to really look at the question, what is the future of the monograph in a digital era um, and long form scholarship? And so it was a committee primarily of um, humanities faculty members and one, um, and it happened over the 2014-2015 academic year. Um, and produced a report if you um, are interested in, in reading it. But one moment in those discussions that really stuck with me was um, a history faculty member saying, I write to be read. And I think that that one short phrase reflects what we also saw authors telling us about their experience with Tome. If you write to be read, the wider the distribution of your work, the more readers you'll reach. Um, so I think that was really kind of a key component of Tome and something we always kept in mind um, going through this process. 
Um, the other piece is, and you know, thanks to the Mellon funding, um, we really also realized that we needed a person um, to really help create and manage a process on behalf of the institution. You know, who gets funding? How do you manage that? You know, who can help faculty answer some of these questions that they have? Um, and so at that point, that was when Home um, was being launched as an initiative. And so we were fortunate. We had Sarah McKee and now May Veloso Lyons, who were within our Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry, um, and were able to work with faculty as well as others on campus um, to really help our authors understand what this meant for them, what was required of them, um, and really go through you know that process with them. So there, I think there were a few really key things. Um, that made this successful um, at Emory. And one of those very foundational things, I think for Tome overall is tenure and promotion. And we were fortunate in that we had a humanities council of faculty members who had adopted, um, who had recommended and then later was adopted um, a statement that digital humanities count towards tenure. Um, and so, you know, we had already had that in place before these discussions began. So we were fortunate that we had fewer questions about that. But that is a question that, you know, still can bubble up among faculty. And then we were also fortunate that um, Michael Elliott, himself a humanist who was PI on the Mellon Grant, became Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And so the question of whether or not the administration is in support of this was, you know, really answered um, by him being in that role. And that support has continued because our Associate Dean of Faculty, Devalina Roy, herself is the author of an open access monograph. So um, we have had, you know, very, um, nice clarity on, you know, whether or not an OA book is any different than any other book, and that answer is no. Um, and so I think that really helped um, adoption and um, answered some of the questions that faculty naturally had um, around open access, particularly early um, in this process. The other thing I think that became very clear and it, I think is true on the institutional side is that you really do need a champion. Um, you need someone on campus who can help wrangle um, the various processes. There is an agreement between the institution and the press, which is a very different thing. The money is passing from the institution to the press to support the open access edition. Um, and so while funding often gets um, attention for very natural reasons, um, I think the the necessity to have um, a point person on the institution side was something that became apparent for us. Um, and we were very fortunate to have that, but it was also a very collaborative process. Um, it's always been a collaboration between the College of Arts and Sciences, our Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry, the libraries, our Emory Center for Digital Scholarship. And so, you know, we really tried to put in place a team that supported our faculty authors um, in whatever way um, was needed um, to really um, help them through this process. And of course, they got the support of the press as well. Um, I will also say that I think we were fortunate in that the funding initially was from Mellon, but has been continued by the College of Arts and Sciences. And so um, the libraries are supporting open access books in a variety of ways. But we were not looking at that challenge of balancing the cost of OA books as part of Tome um, with the collections budget and purchasing books. And I will say that the view of our college administration has been that this is a way to support faculty in the way that they support faculty with a lab and with a whole host of other um, support systems, you know, that doesn't necessarily address the inequities of who has funding available to them. 
Um, but I think it's important to recognize those inequities come and show up in a whole host of different ways within academia. So it's not something unimportant to, to address, um, but it's not just home where you can see inequities. Um, and then I think the other really um, delightful part of this in many ways was that Tome as a pilot did create a community and it created a community of people who didn't always um, interact with each other um, in the same way. We were all figuring out it out as we went, which created both consternation um, and some phone calls and, and discussions. You know, um, I think we did reach a point where we realized it's simply okay that we don't all do this the exact same way. Um, having the presses let our authors know that you know, their book was eligible for Tome was very helpful. You know, campuses are large um, and complex places. And so, you know, that was something that, you know, it was very helpful that the presses could say to an author, you know, your book may be eligible for Tome here. Here's the person to talk to on your campus. And that led us to realize that transparency was also very useful in this process. So we created, um, by we, I really mean Sarah McKee created, um, with input from others, a list of our expectations at Emory, um, both for our authors and for our publishers, um, just so that everyone could easily see on a website what we what our process is, what we were asking for, what we expected. So I think some of that transparency between institutions and, and presses and authors um, was helpful and, and relatively new, quite frankly, um, and kind of bubbled up because of the Tome initiative. And then finally, I do think there are a couple of benefits um, that maybe weren't highlighted in the report, but are there nonetheless, a, a perhaps a tad bit less tangible. And one of those is that I think Tome really is an example of mission alignment. Um, you know, the missions of our universities um, are also the missions of our presses and our libraries. And I don't know that we always think in quite those terms. Sometimes we serve as, you know, customers um, buying a product, but, you know, I think, if you get back to that, you know, fundamental, I write to be read, um, you know, basically Tome really pulled together, um, you know, the various members of universities um, with university presses um, and institutions and helped make that possible in a new and different way. I'll also say that I think that librarians learned more about how university presses worked um, and I think that's, you know, always beneficial. Um, I know that there is a lot of question around, you know, does it really cost that much to, to publish a book? But um, I can also say that there is a lot um, that our authors rely on as far as guidance from their editors. Um, you know, and we've had those conversations with those authors and, you know, that support for our authors um, who are our faculty is an important part of this whole process as well. Um, so I think, you know, that greater understanding of, of the roles and the benefits of, of um, various, various people within the university to support faculty in their publishing of, of books, open access has been, you know, a less tangible benefit, but a benefit nonetheless. Thanks, Lisa. I don't know if um, you have uh, comments that you want to make to each other, I'll, or I can go with questions, but I don't want to stop you from, from reacting to one another if you have conversation. I do want to pick up on this question about, um, which uh, Charles sort of teed up and, and, and Peter talked more about, is this, um, these other initiatives, how, how Tome interacted with, um, was complementary to, uh, um, other initiatives, there's BTA as an open collection, the, um, you mentioned Path to Open and some others. How, you know, and then particularly books that were, I'm really intrigued, Peter, that you mentioned books that were Tome and Luminos and Direct to Open. And, and so what is that, just talk about it from your various perspectives, the complexity of that, and can we, 
is that okay for a while? And to, or do we need to have greater understanding of that? Or is that something to sort of track? Or how, how do you see, um, you know, those those institutions that are continuing to, you know, some of yours to continuing to provide to them, um, interacting in an ongoing kind of way with these other initiatives? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's just part of the unfolding of how we're figuring out the funding model for this, um, mm. that it's, you know, that in many cases, I, I think what stood out for Tome for me was that many of the, many of the other instances are based, the, the initiatives are based at a um, single press. Um, and Tome was agnostic to that. And so we, we, it wasn't, we weren't trying to make our, our um, initiative work to support our press. It was we were we were trying to support all of the presses that were participating, and um, show the institutions that were participating that their money was going to a good to be used used well. And we tried to stay as much out of the middle of that as possible. And I think that was a that was helpful in. Um, how the initiative was viewed, how 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 the pilot was viewed, that um, we let the pup presses pretty much do do the process the way they did it, and if if presses had other sources of funding, we worked with them on that. So, and I think that's what's going to have to happen in in the long run is there's going to need to be more of this collaboration, and any any kind of there's not going to be one single funding um, approach to uh, OA book publishing in the future. Well, that's really interesting. Um, Charles, you're involved in some of these, you know, very, very, several of these different kinds of initiatives. Do you want to sort of talk about how you see Tome and um, some of the other work that you're doing um, in this area and sort of picking up on what Peter, um, Peter has suggested? Yeah, the hybrid funding comes down to really thinking at the individual book level as well. That's what makes this open access work very tricky. Um, and we have had some awkward conversations about double dipping. So uh, the real problem comes when libraries were the source of tome funding. Um, the way um, we've tried to think about it um, in the context of work at Michigan where we are trying to get library support for our fund to mission program and it doesn't cover everything so we need to top up with money that we can get from other sources mm -hmm. the way we've talked about it is like um is is to do with the motivations behind the benefits that each of these programs bring so tome is very much about the motivation is about he helping faculty members get extra reach extra uh, impact, extra um, outside the academy um, engagement. And that's something that really matters to um, deans of humanities, for example. Um, and it, it's really a benefit that exists at the individual title level. And then uh, programs like Fund to Mission, for example, or Direct to Open are very much about collection level benefits. So it's about a library investing in having a whole collection um, more open. Um, and then there are programs where the parent institution is supporting its press. And there it's, again, it's a different motivation. It's about the press extending the reputation of the institution. So the way we talk, had to talk about it, have had to talk about it with books that have received both tome funding um, in collections, who have received tome funding in collections that um, have also library support, is that the motivations, the benefits behind those different pots of money were very different benefits. Um, but it is going to become increasingly difficult to be, um, to be an honest dealer in this space and to be honest. And I think transparency is the only way we can possibly do it. Just being very honest about what we're doing and the way in which each book is its own project. And we're trying to gather the funding to make that possible uh, and fulfill the author's dreams. Thank you. That's really, really helpful. Um, I see a little bit of conversation in the Q and A, um, and um, you've all sort of touched on it a little bit, which is this 
the sort of usage issue, like how how we kind of tracked um, track OA book usage. How do we know who bought the book? Who's downloading it? What like you just talked about increased reach. People authors talked about global reach, that kind of thing. So I wonder if um, you know any of you could talk a, a little bit about Tome's sort of participation in this broader conversation around OA book usage. Um, it's been part of our meetings, you know, for the years and um, sort of where you see the future of that work. So I don't know if Peter, you want to get that started? Sure. Well, um, there's uh, underway. Matt Mellon has put um, a good bit of funding into the OA ebook uh, data trust project that is spun off into two um, two pieces, the data trust and the um, um, dashboard. And so there is, that. that's an example of kind of collective action, I think, that is needed across um, the scholarly communication community to, I mean, collection of, of usage data is, is something that can't be done by one group, one institution, one publisher. It has to be collective. Um, and you have to find a way to do that so that the, the data is trusted, is um, seen as, as, you know, impartial, all of that. And so there, there, there's definitely an effort underway to develop the kind of uh, data gathering and sharing that we need. And, and I really do think that is the key to un kind of unlocking the whole, the whole system, because I think when mm -hmm. if we get to the point where we have um, really reliable sources of usage data for OA books, um, I think authors will, that will, that will impact authors and their perception of OA. And I think also administrators in terms of tenure and promotion, all of that. I mean, one of the things I noticed that, again, at Virginia Tech was I had some authors who participated, assistant professors who were up for tenure, and they they wanted to have, they, they wanted to have whatever data we, I could provide. And it was impossible to, to get that from one place. Um, so I would track down what I could, but I always felt like gee, I bet you there's more out there that I just don't have access to. So that really is kind of the, you know, the holy grail, I think, is is reliable, trusted data. Do those, I mean, Lisa or Charles, do you, do you know, sort of from where you sit in an institution, um, will greater, you know, will this improved data help us understand, you know, the, full demand is every, um, is the idea that we would be able to fund every, uh, every book published on, on, you know, in the institution as an open access book. Is it just some, um, you know, what are like, how, how do you, how are you sort of thinking about that? So I think, um, one of the things that's interesting about the, the desire of authors to have data, mm -hmm. um, around, you know, the use of their book is that there's very little of that for a print book. And so the fact that the book is OA and out there in the world and you know digital raises an expectation that you can track it in ways that I know Peter and Charles are well aware is not as easy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think Tome kind of raised an expectation uh, among authors that was a little more challenging to meet um, than what you know, any of us really had had thought about at the at the start of Tome. And so, you know, kudos to the work that that Peter's done and Charles has done as well, um, you know, to really try and and help corral that data into a single place. And then as all of us who are librarians know, the data only tells you so much. You know, it, it tells you there was a download. It doesn't tell you the who or the why, you know, um, citation metrics tell you a little more, but not everything. And so a lot of what we've heard from authors are really anecdotal stories, um, invitations to conferences that they never would have, you know, even known about or, or considered because somebody, you know, in that country, um, you know, was able to get a copy of the book. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of that reach um, that, 
gives, I think, a little fuller picture sometimes for individual authors. Um, but I think overall, the question of would the data be used by an institution to justify all books, I think we have chosen to really let that be an author decision. It's the author's work. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that every book lends itself well to open access. There are some that are very image heavy and the permissions alone would, would be a challenge. Um, I think there are some authors who, you know, would have some reluctance and I think we need to be respectful of that um, because as I said, it is their work. So I think it's a little less of a push that, you know, all books be open access um, but I think the hope is that for every author who would see benefit from their work being open access, that there is that opportunity for them. Um, and, you know, that that I'm not sure we've quite achieved yet with the pilot, um, to, to be frank. Um, so I think that is more the goal. That was a very interesting, thank you, Lisa, part of the report where um, there were there were some institutions that didn't uh, publicize the funding as widely as they might have, you know, fear, you know wondering whether the, like the, the amount of funding they had and demand for that funding would meet. And so it's partly, I'm, I was really not so much getting into making decisions for authors, but kind of assessing the demand for what that demand would be like. Yeah. And, uh, and I should, uh, it's the questions and answers are, uh, it's a slightly odd system because when we've typed answers, it's sort of grayed them out. Whereas it's more kind of comments really, which is <laughs> a shame because it's a, a really, really good dialogue going on there. Oh, you can um, just click on answered. Oh, okay. Very good. Oh yes. Yes, exactly. You click on the answered and then you see, and it was interesting to see from Ginny, for example, there, there, there have been presses who have turned down funding and the question about which presses did not participate. I mean, I think that really comes back to exactly Lisa's point that not every book is is a book that the author wants to be open access, will gain a particular advantage from being open access. And this intersection of disciplinary uh, culture and institutional culture, and especially press, press cultures. I mean, there are definitely a number of university presses, for example, who are very focused on creative writing communities. And those are communities where there's a strong emphasis on making money from one's work rightly uh the the authors are often not embedded in academic institutions so they're not getting salaries etc so there are some really good reasons why an author may not want to do oa but um just to the point about uh also what we learned about impact metrics you originally questioned judy yes. i mean i think one of the things is just look back at 2018 and the way in which systems were very poorly adapted to actually identify when a book was open access. And just in race at Purdue actually had these questions about who was buying the average of 342 paperbacks, you know, for the first 25 uh, books uh, published by Tome uh, under the Tome auspices. And I think a lot of them were bought just by accident because nobody knew there was an open access edition, right? And in the same way, um, the usage stats, I mean, uh, you know, who knew which edition you were measuring? There were multiple DOIs being allocated. The situation has got better. It's still a mess. But I think a lot of those early metrics are not really good guides to where we're going next. One thing it did do, though, Tome did, I think, is really helped dispel the pernicious conversation about monographs not being used. I mean, I don't see those conversations happening. But back in 2018, every library conference one went to as a monograph publisher was profoundly depressing because the accident that monographs were later into the E environment was being convoluted with the idea of use. So I don't think that comes up much anymore. Print books, yes. E-books, they're used. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we have had some, some Q and A um, attended to, I don't know if there's anything in there we want to lift up um, for further discussion. Um, there is a question about sort of where we would, you know, this trusted entity, where, where we would find, you know, what, what's the trusted entity? Yeah. The question about, and also about, you know, how do we, 
how would would administrators be, agree to kind of pool resources and and you know I I think the jury to me I think the jury is still out on that I I I think that if I mean we unfortunately in the in the U.S. we're not and our higher ed system is decentralized. We're not good at collaborating, cooperating, but I, I still think there's uh, an opportunity for um, there to be collaboration and the universities uh, contributing to, um, you know, an, an initiative like Tome that then distributes the, the funds or is the, the, the central source. I don't know whether that's, you know, unrealistic or not, but I think, I mean, that Judy, you mentioned at the beginning, the need to get scholarly societies more involved. Um, there are ways to go about this that could be successful. It's just, it's not in the academies, the American Academy's nature to be particularly collaborative, unfortunately. Mm. I wanted to, uh, so uh, 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 Mayville also Lyons uh, had this uh, question about uh, the degree under which funding institutions can or should expect transparency from presses mm. regarding book production costs. I think one one thing that may have got um, buried a little bit in, um, in the course of the pilot has been uh, a number of initiatives that were sort of uh, connected to Tome, happened around the same time, happened with the same individuals. And one of those was actually... Um, a university and AU presses association university presses um, uh, um, template for actually reporting on costs of book production uh, developed by Nancy Marin um, and Kim Schmelzinger, and I think that kind of uh, got forgotten, uh, and that's a shame. Another thing was the model contract for digital scholarship that Lisa um, mm. uh, was actually the lead on, and which is exceptionally useful document. I mean, unbelievably useful. We use it for now all of our contracts, but I'm not sure that anybody remembers. <laughs> not many people remember that that was sort of really an outgrowth of Tome. So it's it's not a direct answer, but I I, I can't even find where that um, AU Press's um, model um, uh, accounting template is, but I will try and find it. Uh Another thing I wanted to mention was, again, going back to this kind of double dipping question, one of the things that came out to me during this is how presses, in my experience anyway, presses really were responsible. The participating presses were very responsible in terms of the collecting of funds. So I, I had a number of instances where publishers said, we don't need the full 15,000. We have funding from this other source. Um, so in the cases of where um, where we were working with, say, Luminos or another initiative where there was funding coming from other sources, um, I found the, you know, the presses to be incredibly um, transparent and and willing to to work with us. And so it, it just I I. I think that's really important to realize in this in a, a program like this that we're dealing with actors who, at least in my experience, all want the best um, outcome. Thank and you. we did we did locate the digital monograph costing tool <laughs> thanks to Brenner and also the model contract for digital scholarship. I just put in the answer to May. Great. I think that that believe that's on uh, open monographs. Yeah. Um, but yes, thank you for that. And then also for those of you looking for additional reports about this whole uh, ecosystem is that AU Presses is also conducting research on on the impact on sales, right? That's an ongoing investigation as well. So we'll learn more from that project. Um, okay, I guess um, I'm going to ask for sort of closing closing thoughts, things you'd like to um the community to think about especially maybe those um those institutions that have continued to that are going to continue to um fund tome in this way um you know we've uh suggested 
you know, again, that we would, we would keep the website up to date, work with AU Presses to make sure that there was, you know, people sort of understood in this very lightweight way that here are the institutions participating and here are the presses willing to, um, uh, to accept funding or to participate in this, in this project. Um, sort of what would you like to, what, what can you share with them as they continue this work? I'd, I'd just like to um, just remind people that 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 we we haven't been able to get our hands as publishers enough on money that comes from other parts of the university okay. apart from the library and uh that is absolutely crucial libraries do not have the resources to fund the whole flip that might be anticipated to open access monographs but um institutions do and i just think back to paul Courant's point that um you know fifteen thousand dollars is absolutely um, a drop in the bucket if it's connected into a startup package for a faculty member. And especially if you think that a startup package for a chemistry faculty member is a quarter of a million dollars plus. And now we're talking about something that could be in the package for a humanities faculty member. It's just nothing. It's nothing. And when you also compare it to the whole cost to an institution of supporting all the research of a faculty member that leads to the book. This is a vanishingly small amount of money. And yet there are very, very few institutions actually putting money um, into publishing outside their library. That is a very interesting thing to watch in terms of um, another kind of metric to think about rather than how many institutions can we get to put up funding, how diverse a funding source, you know, the, this issue of outside the library. It's really very interesting. Lisa. Also interesting when you think about an APC for um, yeah. some journals is is comes close to <laughs> um, the fifteen thousand dollars. So you know what's what's equitable in th that kind of an equation. Yeah, and I think um, to to piggyback on both Charles and Peter, I think the the subvention that supporting the faculty member creating the book is a different thing than the mission of the library. And it's not that we don't support open access in a host of ways, um, but really framing those things and really framing it. And I think the provost level may have been a bit too high, framing it for the deans and department chairs, you know, who do have their own budgets and, and framing it as an investment in their faculty, um, because we are still as academic institutions requiring, or at the very least expecting monographs from our humanities faculty. Um, we also are very clear, I think across academia, that we also want our faculty's work to be widely available. Um, not kind of in conjunction with public scholarship, which is slightly different, but, you know, it's the idea that, you know, we kind of bring down the walls of the ivory tower a little bit um, and and have our faculty experts contribute to, um, you know, the, the broader discussions, um, you know, within our society. And if, if those are goals, then, you know, funding the $15,000 for a monograph, you know, really is a small drop in the bucket for the overall budgets um, that people have. And it puts the humanists, I think, a little more on par with the scientists, you know, who do get that kind of support on a regular basis. So, you know, hopefully um, there will be more attention to that paid, you know, and it may be, you know, as more faculty have this experience, they may expect it because faculty do move from one institution to another. Um, and, you know, sometimes saying, I got such and such a benefit at my last institution, why can't you do the same, you know, is one small way of perhaps pushing that forward. Well, thank you, Lisa, for mentioning um, this issue about being widely read. I think I'm just going to close this out with that notion that both the authors and the institutions in terms of stakeholder value um, both agreed that what was really important out of this was making making humanities and social science scholarship more widely available. And so um, very, very happy to have um, participated in, in a program, um, a successful pilot that that contributed to, to that goal. Um, so I wanna just thank the panel so much um, for being with us, for sharing your um, years of um, 
of work in in Tome and then um, you know your years of insight and expertise with us today. So and thank you all um, to in the in our studio audience for joining us today. I think that closes out our community conversation.